Good morning, let's get started. So this morning I will talk about post-logic crypto. In fact, um, two years ago, doing a brainstorm, I was kind of convinced to give this talk, and I was a bit reluctant because it's a lot of work. You have to read all these Snowden documents. Um, but then I, I did this, and since then, actually, I've given this talk probably two dozen times already in several continents. Um, Maybe the most interesting audience was China Crypt in front of 700 Chinese cryptographers. Yeah. <laughs> but so the talk also has evolved because, of course, there is new Snowden revelations, and I think we also um, better understand what's been happening. The summary is very simple. We'll look at the essentials, just summarizing Snowden revelations. Most of you, of course, have read the newspaper and know what's in there, but still my experience is that people kind of sometimes stop paying attention um, or also, newspaper articles are very often not technical, and techies usually don't dig in and try to find out what's really behind it. So the journalist only gives you like half the story. You go a bit more in detail, then we discuss something which particularly touches me, which is how secret services go after crypto, and how all the crypto we've been trying to deploy actually is being undermined. And then we will see how we may have to change our infrastructure and systems and designs to actually address this. I guess the big difference pre and post notion is that I can go now anywhere, even for a broader audience, and mention NSA, and everybody knows who I'm talking about. <coughs> of course, we cryptographers know the NSA because they always used to our conferences. In the beginning, they tried to stop our conferences, they tried to stop publications. Then, in the late 80s, early 90s, they would send beautiful women to our conferences, which who spoke a lot of languages, particularly about crypto. I don't know what they were, they didn't come to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there were strange things happening, I can tell you. <laughs> and then in 1940, NSA for the first time gave a talk at crypto. Um, but they've been very active. What is important is they have two roles. One role is collection analysis of foreign communication and foreign signal data. And you will see there's no important documents, they all have pumped up SI signal intelligence. They also have a second draw, which is known as information assurance, so they have to protect government communications and information systems. What we know from the documents is that they've been very good at this one, but maybe not so good at this one, because in fact, hundreds of thousands of documents could be leaked. A few thousand five documents, and they also contain classified documents of their friend CCHQ, probably very upset with them about this. So, but it's a problem, I think, to have the two conflicting roles in one organization because it's always easier to make wins in attack and forget about the defense. What I hear is that apparently after Snowden revelations, these two services have to work more closely together. They're very big, they have huge budget. You can actually go look at their parking lots. Um, in fact, nearby, they, there is an old motel which they transformed into a museum, and I can strongly recommend it. It's the only museum in the world where you can play with the new machines because they are so bad. In the other ones, you can only look at them, but in the NSA museum, you can actually play them. And then you can also look at their parking lot at the same time. So the other nice thing about Stone Revelations is that I don't have to make my own slides anymore. The NSA makes them for me. So this is actually the NSA slides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any iPhone users in the room here? So what they write about the iPhone is the following. So this is top, sing top secret signal intelligence. Um, who knew in 1984 that this would be Big Brother and the zombies would be paying customers? So maybe I should make this more clear. The NSA says that if you are an iPhone user, you are a public zombie who pay for your own surveillance. <laughs> so they say on their slides. By the way, Android users are the same. So to summarize Snowden documents in one slide, what the NSA does is collect it all, know it all, exploit it all. Collect it all, we kind of knew. Know it all, we kind of knew. Exploit it all, I think, was pretty new. We could have guessed this, but I don't think people understood the scale and impact of exploitation. <coughs> so summary, most of the things we could have maybe estimated given their budgets, given we knew how easy hacking was, and then if professionals go to this, what they can actually achieve. But still, the scale and impact, I think, surprised most of us. We didn't think it would go so far. The level of sophistication, both technical and organizational. For example, 
We teach our students defense in depth, the NSA has offense in depth. We know that they at least had at least three independent ways of getting access to Google Day. Maybe they had more, but we know of three. Okay? So even if the law changes or Google adds some protection, they still had some that. Of course, I will speak mostly about the NSA and the UK, the CSU, but as we will see, Many countries collaborated beyond the Five Eyes, beyond the US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. There is many other countries implied in those schemes. Industry collaborated, sometimes through bribery, sometimes forced to security letters, which is a letter you get as a company, and you're told to collaborate with the NSA or any of their bodies. And if you don't do it, you go to jail. If you speak about it, you go to jail. So it's a very good reason for an executive of an important company to actually collaborate with the NSA. Um, it also has been shown, which the US government officially keeps denying, that they actually are involved in the sort of espionage. It's not only about national intelligence, it's also about spying on companies and using this intelligence for economic purposes. Something that the US always has blamed other countries for, but the Snowden documents clearly show they do it themselves as well, which is to me not a big surprise, but they can no longer deny this. Of course, as a cryptographer, I'm kind of shocked that they've been undermining cryptographic standards, and we'll come back to uh, the Bullwin program later. So, maybe the most spectacular thing in the Snowden documents is <coughs> something called active defense. <coughs> and if you go to the RSA trade show, very quickly after Snowden documents, already 2014, the companies picked this up. It sounds very good. What is active defense? It just means hack everybody. Okay? So, this sounds, of course, very good. Active defense. It sounds like being proactive and cool, but in fact it means hacking everybody. <coughs> so who here has heard about quantum insertion? Okay. A small percentage, which is amazing because this thing actually was widely reported in the press in November 2013. So what you do is actually in quantum insertion is if you enter google.com or facebook.com, rather than getting an answer from Google or Facebook, you have an answer from the NSA. And how do they do it? It's very simple, they're fast. They actually control the network, and before Google even can answer, they actually answer you with their version of Google.com, which means they then go directly to Fox Asset, which is a website with malware. It looks how sophisticated you are. If you're very sophisticated, they may not give you the latest wood kits, they may give you something less special. If you're unsophisticated, you get the most sophisticated wood kits because you'll never detect them anyway. And then they take control of your machine forever. Okay? So I think by now they may have stopped this because, in fact, you can easily detect it. Because after a while, the real answer from Google arrives, and ISPs could easily detect quantum insertion. So they may do other stuff now, but I think the fact that they do is just kind of surprising and amazing. So this adversary, which we always imagined as cryptographers, this Dolatiao adversary actually exists and has been built on a global scale. Okay? So after that, of course, they go for malware injection. And of course, there, also, there is also the famous work on supply chain subversion, where there is, you see the, the Cisco router being changed during shipment, packet is opened, the chip is out, and then the, the router is moved up. So in human <coughs> terms, what we have is, for cryptographers, the Dolby Yawa adversary, what you can see is complete control of networks and systems. And I also will explain a program which is used for airbag systems, for so the really paranoid among us who never plug into the internet or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, even then they can compromise. A big difference is no longer deniable. They can no longer say they do this, although the US still keeps denying, for example, industrial espionage. Last week, director of NSA gave a 45-minute talk, and he never mentioned, of course, at any stage, no or the implications of this. He just acted as if nothing had happened. <coughs> very interesting. We also know that in all countries, oversight on all these things is very weak. The politicians don't understand it. And we don't want to know about this, they just want to see the results. So here is a slide on quantum theory, and I'm not going to go to all the details because I don't have the time, but you're welcome to look at it later. So there's a whole range of programs. It's nothing to do with quantum crypto or quantum computers. It's just a cool name. The NSA is good at using stupid or cool names, as you will see. Uh, but what you want to see on this slide is just the bottom line. Propagation delay from tip to target determines the success rate of the network effect. Less latency is more success. So they just go faster than Google, and this is why your PC is happy to accept it and think it's working to Google, and that's it. And okay, just be faster. Okay. 
So on Wikipedia, you can find some graphs with intensity of surveillance. I don't know how reliable this is. But so you see, of course, the usual suspects, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. Surprisingly, Belgium is not so interesting for them, but Germany is much more interesting. Okay. So <coughs> in the early 90s, I had a talk by Bob Morris, who passed away since. He was the head of the crypto services. He's also the father of the guy who was the first in the world. And he said, I will teach you something from what the NSA, I can't say much. But rule number one of the NSA of non crypt analysis is search for plain text. Because in fact, most people do not encrypt. And this is still the case today, of course, after the relations, we've seen much more encryption, but still, you find plain text everywhere. Where do you find plain text? Of course, in what the NSA calls upstream or fiber. A large fraction of all fiber optic networks are being intercepted. And if you were around in Europe around 2000, there was an investigation by the European Parliament into the national program, which was interception of satellite communication. Okay? So, in the first week of total revelations, um, there were two big revelations done. This is true, 2013. And the first one was the existence of PRISM. PRISM says, in fact, that the NSA gets access from Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and so on, gets direct access into the cloud. Okay? So the second thing is a famous slide shown by the NSA to its analysts. And you should look at the yellow <coughs> thing here. You should use both. So don't only intercept all communications and use this, but also get the data from the cloud. We still don't know exactly how this interface works, whether it's real time or not, and, and what the, the volume is. Of course, the companies who are involved are not willing to tell us, and the NSA is not going to tell us either. But we do know that cloud data ends up in the hands of the NSA. So here you see more details on PRISM. Well, what you see here as detail is that Microsoft was the first to collaborate and Apple the last. Of course, there some may have been added since then. I was told relations are at a certain moment, this document. But so all your good friends are somehow involved. And so Skype, actually, um, as you see here, is in 2011. This is a slide, I think, that made quite some waves in Silicon Valley. Um, this is the famous smiley slide. So what this slide points out is that actually you as a user uses you as SSL or TLS to the Google front end, but actually in its back office, between all its servers, there was no encryption. Of course, most of these servers and the core of it is on US territory, so the NSA is not allowed to spy on this. So they ask their GCHQ friends to do it. Okay? And so this is known as the little program, the muscular program, sorry. And so to quote Bush Nair, if your network operator, in this case level three, has a code name, in this case little, then you're screwed. <coughs> okay, so in fact, we as users saw all of this SSL and we felt very good. But of course, in the back, everything was being um, clear and was intercepted there. By the way, I uh, met an Australian company uh, last December. And so they made quite some business in Silicon Valley by selling all kinds of high-speed lightning cryptos to all the companies who now are encrypting their backgrounds. Here is an example of um, interceptions in Germany in a certain year. So this is last 30 days. So you see it's between 10 and 20 million items um, per day are being intercepted. And this is DNR and DNI. DNR is dial number recognition. This is the metadata. DNI is the context. Okay. So and there is graphs for most of those things. Maybe more cool, um, remember Obama saying we don't listen to your phone calls. Well, maybe that's for the US. Um, the NSA actually intercepts the full content of all phone calls in the Bahamas. Okay? Plus another country which is unnamed. And of course, they collect metadata in several other countries. They also collect metadata in um, the US, as you know. But so the full take, this is the expression for the NSA for taking everything, which means also the content of all phone calls in several countries. So here you see the fiber optic network interception. So this is plans from GCHQ from seven years ago, so it's kind of outdated. So the plan was to tap 17 terabits per second. <coughs> the problem is that most people on the internet send each other videos of cats, and they don't want to store those over and over. So what they do is at the tapping point, they actually are filtering for those kind of things, and they throw them away. So the egress is only four terabits. So they have, they have about a 20% selection rate already on the spot. So what you see is actually massive, and it covers 
most fiber optic cables, most cables are in this <laughs> So what about Skype? So Skype was a European company. It actually got to all the firewalls and actually was in this way to give you free calls everywhere. It was a major breakthrough. Um, what happened is in February 2011, in fact, due to a court order, the NSA managed to get access to Skype in and Skype out out calls, which means you leave the Skype the European network and you go to the regular phone network. And they got the interception at this um, transition points. Then in May 2011, Microsoft bought Skype for $8.5 billion, and one month later, the NSA managed to do Skype peer-to-peer interception. So Skype is no longer distributed, and Skype is no longer protecting you against the NSA. Um, if, are there any Skype users here? So if you use Skype on multiple devices, you know what happens. If, you, if I send you a text, you will get this on your laptop, and if then an hour later you switch on your phone, you get the same message again. Pretty annoying, right? It's also annoying for the NSA, so they actually point this out, and they actually have a, they have a, they explain this. How, what do I, how, why do I receive mobile copies of Skype chat sessions? And they want a tool to get rid of this. <laughs> so this was about content. Content of the transmitted data on the fiber optic, and content of the data in the cloud. So then there is all the metadata. So in NSA speak, DNR. So it's not the plain text, but it's everything around it. Who talks to whom? What is the MAC address of your phone? What is the IP address of your phone? What is the location of your phone? Which websites do you visit? Whom do you call? And so on and so forth. It's actually extremely sensitive information. Um, though the government keeps saying, well, it's just metadata. It's not so bad. Okay. So the second big revelation done in the first week of those revelations was that actually um, the NSA was collecting metadata of millions of US phones from Verizon every day. And this made the Americans very upset because they pay the NSA to spy on all of us except for them. They're not allowed to spy on Americans or people of American soil. So this made Americans upset, not the fact that the NSA is really doing their job, the fact that they also go after Americans. And if I'm not mistaken, this program has now ended. At least, maybe not somebody else is for the US government, I don't know. But at least this was very shocking, and you appear to understand this because the NSA was also spying on America. They're not supposed to do this. Of course, the Europeans are a bit hypocrites in this respect because in 2006, 10 years ago, our European Parliament wrote a directive forcing all the telco operators to store all this metadata as well. And the only difference between countries is whether it was stored for six months to two years. There was a range you could choose as a country. And so, eight years later, in April 2014, European Court of Justice, the highest European court, actually declared that collecting all this metadata is against human rights. Because it's mass surveillance where everybody, innocent and dangerous people, are all being treated the same, and all the information is stored for a very long time. And this information can be abused. So our highest court actually said, <coughs> this is against human rights. What did the UK do? Within a few months, you had a new law saying this was fine in the UK. And most other countries have just looked at this verdict and moved on. So we just ignore our highest court. I think this is very, very warning, warning a society that the highest court, consisting of 16 senior judges, make such a statement and the country just shrug and move on. We just ignore them. You're smart people, so you can figure out that if you have lots of location data of phones, you also know who's traveling with whom. So the NSA had a couple of years ago five billion records a day of where a phone was. And of course, this way you can figure out who's traveling in the same car as somebody else by just looking at some statistical analysis. It's called the co-traveler program. By the way, you may know that Obama um, was very generous and he said, we will stop the friends of friends of friends program. We will restrict the friends of friends program. Right? Only two levels. I have some suspicion that I may be a friend of them. <laughs> You're now with me in the same room for about an hour. <laughs> My phone is there, your phone is here, welcome to the club. <laughs> I should have warned you before, you should have actually left your phone in your hotel room or at home. Okay? This is what friends of friends means. Okay? So 
To the American public, Obama said it's only metadata. Because, of course, the NSA clearly broke the US law by intercepting metadata or asking metadata from Verizon on US customers. And so Obama said, we're not listening to your calls. If you go to Bahamas, it's something else. But in US, we don't listen to your calls. Okay? But of course, a bit later, General Hayden gave a speech and said, we kill people based on metadata. <laughs> <laughs> and if you read the speech carefully, a bit later, he actually says, but that's not what we do with this metadata. <laughs> <laughs> so, very interesting debate. So, what is left, except from data in the cloud, in transit, and uh, metadata is a client system, so you can also hack the client systems. Um, you can use zero days, you can buy them on the market, or NSA can also find them themselves. And then you use sophisticated malware. We've seen some examples of this. Of course, we don't know whether the NSA was Stuxnet and Flame and all the and region or GCHQ did it or somebody else, but at least we have an idea of what's, what's there. It's highly sophisticated malware, way more complex than anything which is used for, by or, or ordinary hackers or criminals. Okay? So we also know they get plain text by hacking your device. Um, the people of GCHQ, actually the employees, complained because it was very disturbing to have to look at hundreds of thousands of pictures of naked people in front of their webcams. It was very disturbing for them and emotionally problematic that they had to do this. Okay. So I guess you also may know that if your mobile phone has a battery in it, so if it, even if it's off, it can be turned into a remote microphone. And it's an interesting development that many high-end smartphones today have a non-removable battery, which means now if you meet with spooks, you have to leave your phone in a different room. In the past, they would actually put their phone on the table and take the battery out so they could prove to each other that they were not being listened to. But today, in fact, they have a separate room where they leave their phones because you can't take out the battery anymore. And I also spoke already about stealing of uh, the keys in SIM cards. So the governments do have those keys if they need them. They just steal them from the vendors just in case. So if you are an important person to the NSA, I guess this is not the mass surveillance of Biden, this is just maybe 100,000 or a few hundred thousand, then you will become subject of the Tower program or tailored access. Tailored access operation, this is special hardware developed to go after individual machines, and in particular those machines that are never connected to the internet. Say journalists, activists, um, and so on, who are very worried about organizations like the NSA and who, by special machines, boot up from tails and whatever, and try to be extremely careful in what they do, they have a special program with devices to go after you. Okay? So there is many technologies. A large list of their catalog was leaked in December 2014 and was published in the Spiegel. And it's really paradise for, for hardware hackers. I can really recommend reading it, reading it and see what they have. It's fantastic. You can find lots of technologies. You can find out how many they orbit and what they cost. So, most of those things put an extra chip in your device, which actually can be remotely activated and remotely listened to. Okay? So, when it is inserted, maybe in a black bag job, or while your device is being shipped to you, the box is opened, the chip is added, and then it goes on to it. So, here is an example of a Rage Master. It's a bit hard to read, but I can tell you what the thing does. So, they put a chip between your motherboard and your screen. It intercepts the red line only. There seems to be enough to figure out what's happening on your screen. Okay. But then how do they get access to the information? Well, they actually shine with a radar from a distance up to 20 kilometers to activate this thing. And this gives it power. And this is enough to then intercept the electromagnetic signals coming out of it. So they never have to make any physical contact. And they can stay 20 kilometers away. <coughs> I don't know whether it's actually healthy that your, your, your machine is being targeted by radar signals from 20 kilometers away, whether you get cancer from it or not, I don't know. But I guess if the day after you're hit by a Hellfire missile, it doesn't matter anymore whether you got cancer the day before, right? That's the point. But so, it's an amazing uh, set of tools, and if you think that by air-gapping your systems you're secure, well, read this stuff. And you see you're actually not. If you're the target of the NSA or any of their colleagues, um, in fact, you're very vulnerable unless you know exactly what's in every chip on your motherboard. Of course, they spy on presidents. This is the president of Brazil, the president of Mexico, Merkel, all the French presidents. I'm always surprised about all the noise about this. If you're a president of a nation, you're supposed to expect that you're spied upon. 
I mean, in fact, that's why you have a secret service to protect you. And they give you, like Merkel, she got a special phone, but she preferred to use her iPhone. I mean, then stop whining, OK? I mean, you're in Berlin, around two are all the embassies. In fact, it leaked later that Merkel's phone was spied on by at least five nations. I mean, then at least use your BSI secure phone because you actually have to protect your country. So rather than whining, you should actually protect yourself. That's what you should do. Um, also, more recent leak about a year ago is um, quite cool, is Ford order spying. So in fact, you can spy. Um, if you want to know what's happening in North Korea, this is pretty tricky. So what you do is you actually have South Korea spying on North Korea, and you hack their systems. And then, of course, this can be used even fifth order and whatever. So this North Korea is spying on China, and, by, and you go all the chains through. All these guys keep spying on each other like you can't make this up yourself. It's amazing. This is actually happening. Okay. So maybe more shocking from a political point of view, especially because there was so little response to this, there is little document showing that the Bundesnachrichtendienst, this is a German secret service, actually helps the NSA to spy on German companies. So your own secret service spies on your companies, gives information to the NSA. Okay? And I will explain you immediately why they do this. Okay? It's kind of amazing that they do this. Of course, that the Germans would spy on the French, you can still understand, but the Germans spying on their own companies and giving the information to the, uh, the Americans or the Brits is really shocking. Okay? They've been hacking antivirus companies, um, and of course, spying on human rights groups, and so on and so on. I think the list is endless. So this slide will try to explain why the BND is actually helping GCHQ and the Americans to spy on German companies. The reason is a system called Tempera. This is a slide I got from George Janessis. So Tempera is a UK system. Um, the NSA counterpart is called x Score Deep Dive. So x Score is a system where Everything is brought together because, of course, you don't want to deal with 500 different systems. You want everything in one central system. And the deep dive one, dive one gives you the more detailed analysis. So pre-Snowden, how did we think surveillance worked? We kind of had some idea how this worked. So what you have is you enter some key. You have all your traffic, satellite interception, prism, metadata, and so on. You have some selectors. You look for certain names. Okay, certain maybe phone numbers are suspicious or email addresses. So as you start investigating people, you enter selectors in this filter. And then what comes in here is, of course, also voice, also fax, whatever. Everything they could do, this is already happening from before. There were devices in the early 90s in which they could intercept voice and fax messages. Of course, now they can do much more. And then you promote traffic. So the special traffic, which matches those selectors, ends up in the database and it's for further analysis. So this is old hat. Tempera is much more sophisticated. What you actually do is you have a ring buffer in which you store the full take. <coughs> everything. You collect everything. Okay? By the way, there is even more collection beyond this. For example, if you use encryption, then all your communication is also stored for long term in Utah. Okay? So just in case they'll in the future be able to decrypt, if you use encryption, you can always ask them for a backup from Utah. Okay? <laughs> okay. But this is just the plain stuff. So all traffic is actually stored. And the estimate is that for three days, it's cost about $200 million. It's about 125 petabytes. So what they do next is they actually have queries to extract metadata and to, to structure the data. And then they do something what Google does. How can Google give you so quick answers if you have questions? Because they've done analysis on the data before. And they can actually give you, within a fraction of a second, answers to complex queries. Well, they have something similar. Okay? So, and then you actually ask queries, and they get answers. And this gives you promoted traffic. But of course, gives you also new selectors um, for the old hat system. Okay. So maybe this is still too abstract. So now I'll try to give you some examples what you can do with this kind of system. Okay? So imagine the Paris attack of November last year. And you very quickly find one phone number. If you enter this phone number into Tempora, you will immediately get the, if it's a smartphone, the email of this phone, the IP address of the phone, the MAC address of the phone. You'll find all the phones that this phone has talked to and their IP addresses and MAC addresses. You'll find all the locations. And all this information will pop up with one query. Okay? Everything related to it will pop up. 
So this is also why, if there is an attack, the secret services can respond much faster than before. This research can now be done in a fraction of seconds by having access to temper. Okay? So sysadmins tend to collect MAC addresses in Excel sheets. So if you want to go after a country, you can query Tempora, find all Microsoft Excel sheets containing MAC addresses in country X. And this is the start of your exploit of country X. So you now find all those things and you can start breaking into this country. You can say which companies are interesting, what are the government services, and so on and so on. If you have a Microsoft box, you get many updates every second Tuesday of the month, as you know. And I don't know what your experience is, but my experience is that about 10% of these updates fails. If the update fails, Microsoft find out, the NSA finds out before Microsoft. They now know you have an unpatched vulnerability in your system. And so, in fact, they can query the system and say which systems in this country are vulnerable to this weakness, and have an unpatched weakness uh, present. If they say, you know, we want to find everybody in a certain country who speaks German and who uses GPG or Singmal, they can do this. Okay? So I think this is important to understand because this is the core of the debate. The NSA and GCHQ say what we do is target surveillance. Okay? But to do this, they actually do mass surveillance. They store everything about everybody, and then they can ask targeted queries. But in the definition of the NSA, if, you, if a human doesn't look at the result of the query, there is no surveillance. This is their definition. But I think it's extremely scary. You have to also think how this could be used for political purposes and go after government, after politicians, and after human rights groups, <coughs> after dissidents, and so on and so on. So if your government has complained, well, of course, there is the, the real core is US, Canada, UK. And then, of course, there is the five eyes. This is Australia, New Zealand. But of course, NATO is also involved. There is also something called the European Circle, which I would say involves some core European countries. Sweden, Belgium is included as well. And there is third party countries and so on and so on. So the message here is there is a broad set of overlapping, non overlapping sets of countries, but most non rogue states are somehow collaborating with the NSA. So, of course, you now understand if I show you Tempora why the BND wants to give data to. GCHQ because the BND wants access to Tempora and they can't write it themselves. Or even if they can write similar software, they don't have enough data. So the BND gives sensitive German data to GCHQ. In exchange, they can ask so many queries per day to Tempora. And I suspect that all governments do this, even the Belgian government. We just haven't seen the documents about it. But it's all secret treaties in which all our governments are involved in mass surveillance um, for targeted questioning of people. So, of course, what France and Germany have been doing in the last two years is they desperately try to build similar systems. Okay? And even if they can't do global spying, they will at least do similar things like active defense, hacking other nations, but also spying on their citizens using this kind of technology. And, of course, Russia and China have been doing this also for a long time. They, they didn't wait for the Snowden documents, but, of course, they now get more inspiration on how to do this. And, of course, soon organized crime and ISIS will do the same thing. So especially the active defense part, I think, will become very popular. So summary, enormous economy of scales. This is why most nations, even Germany, France, are not big enough to do this themselves. So they have to work with the NSA. You should never underestimate what somebody like the NSA can do. Your image of the state is passively listening to everything that's happening. This is an illusion. What they are doing is hacking. They're taking control of systems. They're undermining systems. Um, the NSA made a statement a couple of months ago saying, at least 91% of zero days after we use them, we reveal them to the public for patching. About 91%. 9% they probably never reveal to you. They also don't say after how many months or years they actually tell you that your system is vulnerable. So they try to make a good image, but I think it's actually what they say is actually shocking. So if you care about communication security, well, it's important, of course, but you really see the battle is being fought in the end systems. And I don't think this is going to be stopped by asking them nicely. I think we have to really be much better at getting supervision of these agencies. Uh, Non-proliferation treaties, I think, is very important. You may have seen that last fall, China and the US signed something. What it means, I don't know. But 
nations are understanding that it's going so far they have to stop it at some stage because they're undermining each other's critical infrastructure. In the end, everything may collapse. So the only advice I can give you personally is if you buy your next device, buy more RAM because so many nations will be trying to put malware on your device that there will be a RAM shortage. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only real prediction I can make which is probably practical advice. And also I think the other thing is if you want to protect against them, well, you can better give up. Right? You can use encryption everywhere, but you have to assume they will control your end device if you have something valuable. Okay? That doesn't mean you have to do something bad. Right? Remember the Belgacom case? In the Belgacom case, what happened was TCHQ went after a company that manages traffic between Asia and Africa. If you look at the graphs and the diagrams, this is a, a black spot for the Five Eyes. So communication between Asia and Africa is very valuable to them. And Belgacom happened to control a company that did this. So an innocent sysadmin of Belgacom was actually infected by the region. This guy is not a terrorist. This guy is not a criminal. This guy is just managing networks for Belgacom. And he was the target. His machine was undermined. If you're in between them and their target, whatever. You're fair game. It's not because you're a terrorist or a potential criminal. It's you're in their way. They will hack you. OK. So now about the crypto. So I've been involved in ISO since 1990. I don't go as frequent anymore in the last five years, but I was very active for at least 15, 17 years. And of course, NSA is always there in ISO. And you can always see that NSA has a special agenda. Um, we knew about this. So on the other hand, I think um, after especially AES, and the fact that the US government selected the Belgian algorithm to become worldwide standard and the US standard for top secret data later on, I think there was a little bit of more trust in NIST and the NSA. Um, of course, the NSA has been behaving strangely and NIST has been doing strange things, but many standardization bodies do this. But then actually in September 2013, um, the New York Times published an article about Bull Run, more or less showing that the second crypto war had started even before we knew it. So the first crypto wire was about Kiosko and Clipper. We thought we won this, then we got restriction of export being removed or much less controlled exports. But then we found out, in fact, behind our backs, the NSA had been doing everything they could to undermine encryption. Okay. And this is the bull run program. So if you can't get the plain text because people use encryption, you can just ask for the key. Okay. Your security letter and then you get the key and that's it. It's of course very hard to get evidence of this because the guys who got such a letter, they can't speak about this and if they do speak about it, they go to jail. There is some um, effects or some lepers from the LavaBit case. LavaBit was um, an email provider with a central SSL key which control, encrypted all the, all the emails so it was not super secure. But it happened to be the email provider chosen by Snowden. So of course this guy got strange letters. And he can't show us the letters but um, he shut down his company rather than comply. Okay, so I have strong suspicion, but of course no hard evidence that the NSA asked Google for their <coughs> SSL key. Remember, I told you there were three ways the NSA could get access to the key to Google data. One is Prism, the other one was via level three, via little, so the, the backbones, and the third one is having their private decryption key. This is the reason why Google has switched in November 2013 from RSA to Diffie-Hellman, because in Diffie-Hellman, there is no long-term decryption secrets present in Google. There is only authentication secrets present in Google. So, of course, I can't prove this, but this is strong evidence, okay? There is also other strange things that happened. For example, um, Silent Circle offered secure email, and they shut it down overnight. This is not a proof, but it's kind of bizarre. You have a service, there is a new market for this, and without any comment, you suddenly shut it down. So what has happened? Well, think about it for yourself. What could have happened? Why did they do this? Okay, so in fact, Labra Levinson, um, owner and operator of LavaBits, said, in fact, if you have something to secure, don't secure it in any company which has ties or which is based on US soil. That's more or less what he says. So he can't say a letter, but think for yourself. Of course, if you can't get the private key by asking for it, you can try to find it. And of course, the GCS2 has a program called Flying Pig in which they carefully study, probably a long time before the EFF, the SSL ecosystem. And for example, um, 
there were still people using 512-bit encryption. And then last year, we learned of a paper, a very cool paper, showing that you can actually make SSL connections fall back to legacy export 512-bit, break this in real time, and then take over the connection. So the, then you find the session key, which is used later on. So you can suspect that the NSA or GCHQ had similar techniques before. And they knew that this presence of export suites was usable. Many servers use 1024 bits, and I think back of the envelope calculations show you that the NSA and GCHQ have the money to actually crack those keys. Maybe not for everybody, but at least for important targets, yes, they can do this. If you can't get the private key, <coughs> why not substitute the public key? Okay? So I gave you the details on the SSL and the CA ecosystem in the browsers. I don't think the US government messed it up, but the fact that the commercial environment messed it up is very convenient for them. The fact that there is 600 companies trusted, and you can just buy a few of those or give them some money to make them behave your way. And of course, other governments have done this. So the, the, the Turkish, the French, and the Chinese got caught doing this. Even Symantec got caught doing this. Of course, in their case, it was only an accident and a mistake. But that's always the case. In Turkey, it was also just a mistake. We're sorry for this. Um, I guess the coolest thing we saw was the flame crypt analysis. Um, what happened was that in May 2013, some new malware showed up. Flame, which actually found a new collision for MD5 to forge certificates. So it was completely different from the collisions we knew before in the academic world. So this shows a highly sophisticated opponent undermining certificate infrastructure and using cryptanalysis for this to actually spread malware. So there is also some good news that there is less encrypt since live since November 2015. Um, this is trying to make it a lot easier to get certificates. Um, they still don't have, uh, they've not been vetted to be in the store of Mozilla, so they've been certified by Ident Trust, I believe. So they actually, it's like a second order and they're, they're working on, it takes about one year to be vetted to be a root CA in the browsers. So that's a way to make it easier to use encryption. And this is kind of a grassroots movement, so maybe it will be very hard to undermine this. So if you can't get the key, why don't you make sure the key is generated using a random number generator with a trapdoor? So messing up generation of random numbers is easy, as I explained to you yesterday. But in fact, the NSA did better, and they actually built one with a trapdoor. So what happens if you need a key? You just have a seat which can be based on mouse movements and other information on your device, hardware and software information, and you stretch this with a PRNG to a key. If you have a trapdoor, you may be able to predict keys. I will show you how it works. So NIST published a standard um, in 2005. It was a draft. And it contained four algorithms. Two were designed by NIST and two by the NSA. The whole process happened inside ANSI, the banking standard unit in the US. And there were about 10 to 12 people around the table who probably all knew what was happening. Okay. What happened then is that the NSA submitted, when the draft was finished, they submitted a 100-page document to ISO. And the standard in ISO had not been progressing for years. And suddenly, there was a nice text. So ISO, more or less within two years, approved this. Um, ANSI is quite close. As an outsider, it's very hard to get in. ISO is a bit better, but even then, you know, you have to be a formal member and so on. And I was a member, but I didn't have time to look at this stuff, to be honest. Um, and then, in fact, they came back to NIST in 2005 because if you want to get your products validated, you have to have a FIP standard. And then they can impose it for selling it to the Department of Defense and the US government. So, but only for the validation, they had to actually go to NIST. And the problem is that NIST has quite some visibility and they have open processes. <coughs> so in that, that was the first time I would say, December 2005, that the standard with four um, deterministic random bit generators, is a NIST name for a PRNG, that in fact, this was exposed to the wider public. So personally, I thought this was ridiculous. So they had four algorithms and three were based on symmetric key and one is based on public key. Now, this elliptic curve stuff is completely outrageous because it's 100 times slower than all the others. So I would never, ever have recommended anybody to use this. So I was also not interested in what the NSA wanted to do because it's kind of, you know, but let them have their stuff. Nobody cares because nobody will ever use this anyway. Nobody in their right minds, at least. So when this publishes this, they got immediately kind of some warnings. 
So before the problem is a standard, some people said, we did some tests, and in fact, this random generator is not random. There is a bias in there. Okay? It's not even random. We run tests, and it's not good. But NIST ignored this. Um, and then there was also a paper around that time saying that um, if the relation between P and Q, because this standard relies on two parameters, P and Q, if this relation is secret, then this is probably secure if discrete log is higher or something. So there was a statement which gives some people a warm, fuzzy feeling. Okay? Then after publication, 2007, what happened at the crypto RUM session, <coughs> Ferguson and Shumov from Microsoft, they actually said, hey guys, um, if somebody would generate first P and then compute a secret parameter D himself and then compute Q from P and D, then this standard has a problem, there is a backdoor in there. Okay? Now I have to point out that Ferguson was part of the original ANSI committee. So you probably knew this already since 2001. But for some reason, Microsoft decided to go public and complain about this. Okay? We still don't know why it took, it took them six years. Um, what Certicum did was even more interesting. So Certicum was also in the ANSI committee. What they did is they filed a patent for an escrow random number generator. And they said, if you want to avoid this key escrow, you can do it like this, and then you have to pay us royalties. You know, quite cynical as well. Okay? But so this more or less gives a lot of circumstantial evidence that everybody around the table in 2001 in ANSI knew what was happening. They knew that NSA was putting a backdoor in there. But for some reason, they decided not to speak up. And so in 2007, they spoke up. So we cryptographers naively thought if in front of former cryptographers, Microsoft says there's a trapdoor, within a few months, NIST will withdraw the standard. Right? What did NIST do? Nothing. They got a letter from Bruce Schneier, and they answered him something well, there were some vague comments, and they didn't do anything. So, of course, when in 2013, New York Times then said there is a problem, then, of course, suddenly everything exploded, and people figured out that this, this standard had never been removed. So, in fact, P and Q are in the standard, and the appendix says the security of this standard requires that the points P and Q be properly generated. To avoid using potentially weak points, the points specified in appendix A1 should be used. So in fact, as a user, you're actually forced to use the PNQ backdoored by the NSA. In fact, it was even more tricky. If you would change PNQ, you would never get your product certified, which is bizarre because random number generators don't have interoperability requirements. You know, you can use a PNQ and I can use a different one and our products will perfectly work because random numbers don't need to be the same on both sides, right? They'll never be the same, okay? But so NIST points out, if you change PNQ, you have a problem. So use the ones we recommend you. So between the lines, so NSA can exploit their backdoor. Quite interesting. So of course then, the shit hit the fan in September 2013, and then within a very short time, NIST recommends against using dual EC. Um, and then of course, a few months later, it was leaked that BeSafe, a library from RSA, which was still widely used, they claim mostly among governments, but I have some suspicions about this, um, actually was using dual EC as the default. And then it was found out, or leaked by Reuters, in fact, that um, the, NSA, the RSA received a $10 million contract from the US government around the same time the switch was made. Is there a connection? Is this bribery? Strange things happened. But so our view as cryptographers that nobody would use this stuff because it was so slow was already completely undermined because actually companies supplied to the US government were putting it in voluntarily or after some nice monetary compensation. So it was being used. Okay, so how does it work? So an RNG has a state. So this state is started up from mouse movements and process timing and whatever. Okay, and what you do is you update the state and you do this. Um, you don't need to know the details, but you actually multiply this point on the curve by P and you take the exponent. And then you take the new state and you multiply it by Q take the x-coordinate, and then you truncate. Why do you truncate? Because otherwise you have a bias, okay? How much should you truncate? Well, if I would design this thing, I would truncate to half. But what they did is they only truncate two bytes. You will see later why this is the case. So then you update your state again with P, you output again, you compute R with Q, and so on. So this is how you keep working, okay? This is, you update your state with P, and the output is done with Q. 
Okay? So if you now know D, I'm not going to show you the map, but if you know D and you have the value R1, you can actually go by this. And if you have one output, then you can actually compute the intramural state and, of course, all future outputs. Now the question is, how does the attacker get one output? Well, look at SSL or IPsec. What happens is the client first sends a nonce to the server. This is a random number, which is sent in clear over the network, which is used for authentication purposes, so the server will sign this or, or will decrypt this or whatever. So, in fact, the protocols are designed in such a way that you get this nonce for free, and from this nonce you have to guess two bytes, and then with D you can actually bypass this triangle and actually compute the state, and from now on you can compute all possible outputs. What is computed in this stage is the session key. Okay, simple and elegant. So now you know why it's only two bytes, because it means you have to do 2 to the 16 guesses to predict the session key. If you would truncate 10 bytes, it would be too difficult. Okay? So this is how it works. The NSA said, uh, the only comment they made was, well, you claim there is a backdoor. We don't, and of course, they never co formally confirmed they have the D. We don't know they have the D, but it would be crazy not to have the D. And they said the attack would be too hard to do. And then, of course, a team showed that it was actually possible to do the exploit more or less in real time, even with modest computation. In some cases, it takes a bit more time, but the NSA has quite some computers, so you should not be worried. They can, in real time, decrypt communications protected using dual EC as random numbers. Okay. So, last December, a news story um, hit the newspapers. Juniper, a router company, actually um, announced two vulnerabilities in their net screen, in certain versions of net screen. And in fact, they confessed, which they did before, that they used dual EC. So it's not only RSA and BSafe, it's also um, Juniper. Of course, many products support dual EC because if you are producing for the US government, you have to go to this FIPS validation, which is time consuming and expensive. So what you do, of course, is you will implement the four generators. Because if you implement only three, and then a year later your customer asks for the dual EC, then you have to go to the whole process again. So even if people didn't want to use dual EC, they always have it in their products. And it's seen that many actually activated it, maybe because they got some bribery or some phone call to maybe do this. We don't know yet. So Juniper published two advisories okay, about specific versions of their screen OS. It said, discovered unauthorized code in the screen OS software that powers net screen firewalls. So actually, Juniper was hacked and somebody put strange code in there. Or they had an internal hack and some part of their company went rogue. So two backdoors were found. So Juniper published, of course, the vulnerability, the impact, and the patch, but they never said actually what the problems were in detail. So the hackers, of course, went after their code using the patch and they found all the problems. So, the second problem is that, this is, we'll come back to this, a passive eavesdropper can decrypt VPN traffic. The first one is that you can bypass authentication in SSH and Telnet. <coughs> so the first vulnerability was inserted in April 2014. And so the passport, password was discovered in the code very quickly. It's this password. Okay. This is kind of a, an ordinary hack. You just put in a special password that works with any username and that's it. It's kind of shocking, but you know, it's not high tech or nothing sophisticated. So now back to the second vulnerability, the second backdoor. So, of course, in October 2013, one month after the bull run release, Juniper said ScreenOS does make use of dual EC, but it's designed to not use dual EC as its primary random number generator. It's used <coughs> in a way that it should not be vulnerable to the possible issues that has brought to light. So what in fact they do is they take dual EC, they produce random bits, and then they run those to ANSI X931, which is another random number generator. Okay. So in fact, you never get to see the raw output of dual EC, so you can never do this D trick. Okay. So the hackers found out that actually the following changes were introduced on October 20, 2008. So dual EC was added, but a different queue was used. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that somebody else put their own backdoor in there. Okay? Generated a D prime and computed a Q prime and now had their own backdoor. Of course, that's not enough because it was hard to exploit, so the RNG code suddenly had global variables. Okay? So 
there is this cascade of two RNGs, but it turns out that there is a very subtle bug in the code so that a for loop is never executed. And in fact, this ANSI X931 is never used. Of course, you will never find this unless you're told there is a problem there. Okay. Now, there is more problems because, in fact, doing the attack from 20 bytes is pretty tricky. So, in fact, the protocol was made more secure by outputting a 32-byte <coughs> which makes using the trapdoor a lot easier. By the way, the NSA has always been trying in the last years, since publication of Dual EC, they went to IETF and said the nonsense in IPsec and SSL are too small, you have to have larger nonsense so to make their attack actually easier. Because the larger your nonsense, the easier it is to recover the state. Okay? But in ITF, they were kind of rebuffed, fortunately, for not for technical, but not for backdoor reasons, because people had other reasons to not want to do it. They thought that the current nonsense was enough. But so Juniper changed to this. And then, of course, so this is increased nonce. And then there is actually a big problem in uh, Juniper or in IPsec. In TLS, you first make the nonce, and then you generate your key, right? Well, in IPsec, it's the other way around. You first make your key, and then you make the nonce. So what they did is they rewrote the code so the nonce was actually generated first. Okay, so that, in fact, the nonce would give you the state before the key was produced. Otherwise, this nonce gives you the state, but it's too late because the key has already been produced. Okay, so kind of, you can't think this is a coincidence, right? I mean, all these things are there to carefully hide there is a trapdoor and to make dual EC exploitable. By the way, this is all based on the talk given by Ofaf Shaham um, at Real World Crypto um, last January. The, the slides are available in public, and he gives more code examples. I just shortened this to a couple of slides. So then, four years later, more changes were made. There was yet another point put in there. So probably the Chinese or somebody else found out the backdoor and changed Q again. Okay? And so Juniper calls it an unauthorized patch. Okay, so the previous one was apparently authorized, but this was unauthorized. And then, of course, the interesting thing is that what they did in the patch, they removed this special password, and they replaced this, this point Q prime again by Q. So in fact, the patch left in this backdoor. So let's call this the NSA backdoor. I don't know why they changed P and Q here, but maybe to draw less attention, I don't know. But then apparently some other nation took over this random number generator and changed Q by Q prime, so they could now decrypt. So rather than actually activating this ANSI X931, reducing the RNG, and stopping this pre-generation of nonsense, the only thing Juniper did was actually uh, change Q prime back to Q, so the NSA could again eavesdrop on that screen OS. So I guess this is, I don't know whether you find it shocking, I find it all shocking. Right? Of course, we should not be shocked about everything anymore. But I think there is now hard evidence that this dual EC stuff is being massively exploited. That's one. Second, there is also hard evidence that if you have a backdoor in your code, there is a big chance that some other nation will take it over some other day. And this has been what cryptographers have been saying for a long time, but now there is actually hard evidence it has happened. <coughs> of course, Juniper has, no longer com has not commented on all these things here, and I don't know whether they're going to solve the real problems or not. Okay. So that's it. So. All this backdoor stuff, yes? You know, I just asked about modified backdoor. Who, who discovered this? Was, this? was this? So what happened is that Juniper makes its release. Okay? Immediately then a community of people, I mean some hackers and some cryptographers, sat together and looked at all the versions and did diffs and find out what has changed. So Juniper never told us what has changed, but of course, given that there were patches in specific locations and given that we were searching for dual EC, these guys reverse engineered all the versions of NetScreen from a certain period and found out what happened. But, but Juniper never came clear and didn't say this is what happened. But the code is out there, right? Of course, not in source code, but people just reverse engineered all the assembly code and they, this is what they found. No, because Juniper, on 17th of December, replaced Q prime again by Q. That was their second patch. But that was after the community. No, no, no. The community started looking, at that moment, the community started looking, say, what is behind this? And then started reverse engineering all the versions of NetScreen, and then they discovered the full story. But Juniper never leaked the full story. We only found out the full story by all this 
hard reverse engineering work. So, so it's plausible that the NSA discovered that they couldn't break in anymore? And then yes, yeah. exactly. We don't know, yes. It, it's, very, it, it's very hard to say. Maybe this Q prime was also from the NSA. We don't know, right? I mean, it's, nobody knows what actually happened. I guess Juniper actually must have logs and may be able to find out, or they should be able, but I guess they're not going to tell you. So, in fact, in the 90s, uh, Moti Jung, who now works for Google, together with Adam Young, they actually wrote a whole series of papers in which they showed, they call this um, kleptography, and then later changed the name to cryptovirology. They showed that if you use a crypto library written by somebody else, they can always screw you over in many ways. Okay? And so the rumor has it, I can't give you names or confirm it, that NSA was inspired by this work to actually do the dual EC work. In fact, in their papers and in their book, they show you how to trapdoor discrete log systems. They don't show you how to do dual EC. So in fact, the community was warned for this by the work of Jung and Young. So we should have been more careful because we knew about this. And unfortunately, this research also inspired the NSA to do bad things. OK, so December 2014, so this is one and a half year into the Snowden revelations, Spiegel leaked that actually um, the NSA can decrypt in real time many encrypted communications. And this is SSL, IPsec, SSH, PPTP, Skype, and so on. So of course, we don't know how it works. Maybe they use weaknesses like Heartbleed. Maybe they ask for private keys. Maybe they exploit weak random number generation in IPsec. But so the numbers for five years ago was 20,000 secure VPN connections per hour. And so what you see here is, you see the interception infrastructure with turmoil. And so in special cases, if ciphertext is being used, it goes to a long haul system. And this is something we don't know much about it, but this actually may be cryptanalysis, maybe cracking RSA keys, maybe exploiting vulnerabilities, maybe reverting dual EC. But so the difference is with normal, normally your stuff goes to Utah, but in this case, they're able to decrypt in real time, almost as fast as the recipient, and put the whole thing into tempera or excuse code deep dive so they can in real time listen to your encrypted communications. Okay, so that was kind of Shocking to most people. So, summary, how do they file crypto? They exploit our implementation weaknesses. They ask for the keys, they undermine standards, and maybe they also do cryptanalysis. Like maybe they're very good at factoring. What also helps them is increased complexity of standards. All these options in TLS and the fact that IPsec is 48 documents, this is fantastic for the NSA. Because that means that they can devote dozens of people to look at this, and they have time to look at all the implementations, which are probably all have problems. And we don't have enough time to do this. Export controls still help them, of course. Even if we just supply it as a fallback, they can make our things fall back and exploit it. And there is, of course, hardware backdoors. And the other thing they do, of course, is they work with the FBI and they convince vendors to actually put, give them trap doors or back doors. Um, and the FBI can publicly say this because, of course, they go after the bad terrorists. So they have to actually get help from the company. So, if you look at crypto in the past decades, I mean, when I started in crypto, late 80s, um, crypto was actually pretty rare. I mean, we did consulting for governments and banks, but you know, a crypto box cost 10,000 euros. It was a hardware box, quite big and heavy. Um, and of course, the banks had this for the ATM infrastructure for probably their core infrastructure for secure communications. Companies like SWIFT and the credit card companies had encryption. Of course, also the military, the diplomats, but crypto was something in the scale of millions. It was not in the scale of billions, okay? Today, in fact, um, if you look in your pockets, you'll find EMV cards with public key crypto. You'll find a GSM with crypto. You have a smartphone, which has crypto libraries. Your laptop probably has dozens of crypto libraries. Um, there is crypto everywhere. Okay, so in some sense, in about 25 years, we've gone from scarce crypto to, my estimate is about 30 billion crypto devices out there. And the prediction is this will go up quickly. So in some sense, you can say cryptographers, we have one. But if you look at what crypto is used for, it's mostly for code updates and for transactions and payments. I mean, in fact, for protecting user data, we still use crypto way too rarely. Okay. So some numbers that may be interesting to you, so this is symmetric crypto. There is <coughs> six billion encryption on phones, about six billion access cards, like the one I used to get into the building or into the parking lot of faculty club, this kind of MyFair, MyFair Plus. 
three and a half billion of bank cards in symmetric crypto, one and a half billion for Blu-ray and DVD, half a billion hard disks, 300 million pay TV systems, 250 million game consoles, and 200 million readers for access cards. This is, don't trust all these numbers, but I think the order of magnitude is correct. Okay? So now, what is used to protect user data? Well, this is what is in green, because blue things are authentication or content protection. So content protection, it means that the movie industry or the audio industry wants to protect their content against you as a user. So content protection doesn't help you, it helps them and sees you as the enemy. So this is why I put it blue. You can of course argue that some is good for you, your bank card is secure, but still your bank card is there in the first place to prevent you from withdrawing too much money. Right? In fact, it's also to protect the bank against you. Of course, it also protects you against criminals, so it's a bit of a gray case. But so what really encrypts your data for confidentiality is GSM, and GSM, of course, we know it's not end-to-end. -end. It stops at the base station or base station controller. And then we have, of course, hard disks. So today, if you buy a hard disk, with a good chance it has encryption. It has actually hardware encryption in it. And what happens if you take your hard disk, unplug it, and put it in a different machine? Have you ever tried this? It works. So in fact, in most people have an encrypted hard disk, but they don't have the key management that goes with it, because that's too painful, and you have to pay extra for that. So in fact, you have disadvantages of encryption, because if your hard disk crashes, and then you go to a recovery company, they will only find cipher text. So they can give you every bit of your data, but only encrypted because you don't have access to the key. And so you have a disadvantage of encryption, but you don't have the protection because you don't have the software and the expertise to manage the keys. So companies, of course, do have this, but as a user, you only have the disadvantage of hardware encryption, which is it becomes slower, it costs more, and you can't recover your data after a crash. Okay, so this is what we do with Symmetric Crypto to help people. I would say very little. Okay? I guess I should also add wireless LAN here, but this is, this is the same category. Of course, there is probably 3 billion wireless LAN devices, but this is the same thing. It's not end-to-end. -end. It encrypts to the access point, so it gives you some protection, but it doesn't give you real protection. <coughs> Public key is a bit less deployments, about 10 billion. Um, the biggest thing is the automatic update system. Then there is close to 3 billion um, EMV cards out there. Then 2 billion browsers. WhatsApp, I think, is now close to a billion. Then there is pay TV systems, there is Skype is half a billion, IDs and passports, EMV terminals, SSL servers, IPsec. This, this, I don't have good numbers there. Probably it's higher. There's more VPNs than 8 million, but it's very hard to get good numbers on this. It's not a billion. It's probably somewhere between 10 and 100 million. I don't have good numbers. It's very hard to get. There is about a million Bitcoin public keys and there is 500 public keys used to protect the NSSEC. So what is interesting here is what is green? What is there to encrypt user data? Well, there is the browsers and, of course, the SSL servers. This is quite large, but I explained to you on Wednesday what all the problems are with this. How the ecosystem is undermined by the fact that the root CAs can actually be compromised. It actually means you don't get much security. So if the U.S. government really wants to go after you, your browser will not protect you. And, in fact, not only the U.S. government, if your government or your company wants to get access to your data, they can undermine SSL security. Okay, so we have Skype. I told you what happened to Skype, so I don't need to repeat that. Skype does not give you end-to-end -end encryption secure from the US government. Okay? So there is WhatsApp, widely used, end-to-end -end encryption. What happened to it? It was bought by Facebook. Does Facebook get security letters? I don't know, but it's kind of bizarre that if something starts hitting the half billion mark, it suddenly gets bought by a US company, and maybe they change something to the code. Who knows? Right? I don't know. I don't, I don't have hard evidence here, but just think about it. Okay? So, in fact, if you want to become rich, make sure you actually develop an encryption product which hits the half billion, and then you will be bought by a US company, and then you can retire on a Caribbean island. Okay? That's more or less a perspective for your future. <laughs> Is there secure encryption? Um, well, this is an, another Snowden message which says OTR. OTR is a system designed by uh, Jan Goldberg and some others. It says OTR encrypted, not encrypt available. So apparently some things they, don't, they cannot encrypt or at least they don't want to encrypt and show it to their analysts. Okay? So of course, 
We should be aware that Snowden only has SIGINT documents and he never could show us like the crypto journal of the NSA. I wish he could, right? So we don't get crypto knowledge from Snowden. We only get what the crypto unit tells the analysts to the SIGINT guys. So, but what they cannot decrypt is TrueCrypt, but you made TrueCrypt stopped and then forked. And it kind of passed the security orbit, got good marks, but still it's kind of bizarre that around the same time that this all happens, it actually stops. Um, GPG, I guess they may undermine your end system, but still. About Tor, the NSA writes Tor stinks. So some documents from a couple of years ago show that they cannot systematically identify every user, but they can go after specific users. This was, of course, a few years ago. Today, I would be more worried but they've invested more effort on it and they can now do this. Um, and things like ZRTP protocol in things like Redphone and Signal and so on, this seems to give them problems as well. So what gives them problems is long keys for RSA, DV, Hellman, elliptic curve and AES, open source code, end-to-end -end security, but all those systems unfortunately have a limited user base. So we don't have an end-to-end -end secure system that protects a billion users. So in fact, as cryptographers, we failed miserably because we have cryptography to protect companies against users, we have crypto to protect com governments against other governments, but we don't have crypto to protect users against the rest of the world. We failed our user base. So, I think an interesting question, and I'm not going to go into the policy today, is should we try to find the technical level? Should we actually say, let's put our, um, make teams and build secure encryption for everybody, open source, make sure that all these things become easy to use. I guess at the same time, we should probably talk to our governments and say, we don't think it's acceptable that you as a government participate into mass surveillance systems and you feed this ecosystem, because I think in the long run, it has a very big risk for undermining our democracy and our values. And I think some indication of this is that if the highest courts start saying that certain things are unacceptable and governments keep doing them, I think this is already by itself a threat for our uh, democratic systems. So what can we do? So of course, if done right, encryption works. And OTR is an example of this. So I think it's all our jobs as technical people, cryptographers, software developers, to get encryption right and to make sure users are protected. Okay? I think standards, of course, we should use standards. We should not try to invent our own, but we should really fight more to keep them simpler and easier to deploy, easier to use, okay? So, of course, there is many problems like GSM weaknesses, the fact that most encryption is not end-to-end, -end, the fact that Skype, so Microsoft goes out everywhere and speaks about transparency. They said, our response to Snowden revelations is we will become more transparent because obviously Microsoft is concerned about these non-US users. But if you then ask questions about transparency of the Skype protocol, so you get no answer. So we should pressure Microsoft to say, you have half a billion customers using Skype, please show us the cryptographic protocols, please give us assurance that this is actually secure and there is no backdoors in there. You have weak implementations and backdoors like Dual EC, we have weak governance like DigiNota example. Of course, we still have to look at routing and domain name services. We still don't have secure routing today. So a couple of years ago, Somebody in China changed, made a massive change to routing tables and suddenly a large fraction of all the internet traffic went over China. And China said, oops, a mistake. So, but the point is they wanted, they had this system, they wanted to see whether they could do it and yes, they can do it. In fact, any nation with enough money and enough systems can actually route all the inter internet traffic to this nation to do whatever. Okay, and of course you can do enormous damage um, both in availability of the internet but of course also in going after dissidents and so on, because of course this pickup, even if you do it for only half an hour, you can see lots of information in there. Who's accessing what and so on. So, the big problem is backdoors. So I think even today, only a very small fraction of traffic is protected. I think we should really have all our web traffic protected. This would be not a few percent, not five percent, it should be 99.9 percent. .9%. And of course, most of the traffic where there is protection is not end-to-end -end and with high security. So, on the research side, we have to look at secure channels. So, as cryptographers, we understood encryption, I think, and modes somewhere in the 80s, early 90s. Authenticated encryption 
I would say we started understanding this in the late 90s, although there is still quite some research today, you'll be surprised at our present day crypto conferences in which people discover new features, properties, weaknesses, of authenticated encryption. You think it's simple, but it's not so simple. So what, how to deal with compression, with fragmentation, uh, what happens if you get a wrong Mac? So then what, how, what do you do? How do you respond? Which kind of error messages do you give? And so on and so on. So there is actually still some research being done there. And there is also an open competition called the Caesar competition, where we got about 60 entries. And now in the second phase, it goes a bit slower than expected, but hopefully in a year or two years, we'll be able to recommend you better schemes, which means better understood security properties and better performance. Forward secrecy. Um, this means that if you're currently hacked, of course your future is gone. If the NSA hacks your machine and they're in control and you have no security for the future, the only thing you can do is buy a new machine or erase everything and start again. But what about your past? So remember, if you used encryption in the past, your data is in Utah. So if the NSA ever gets access to your keys, they can actually now go to Utah and decrypt all your past data. <coughs> So how to prevent this is use forward secrecy, a concept introduced by Diffie, Winner, and Van Orschot in 1992. And the idea is you use Diffie-Hellman and you sign the Diffie-Hellman exponentials. It costs more than just doing RSA for key exchange, but in fact it gives you forward secrecy because if the NSA compromises your signing keys, they cannot go to Utah and then decrypt your Diffie-Hellman. Of course, if they ever build a quantum computer, then you're cooked because then they can break the Diffie-Hellman part, but at least you don't store long-term commerciality secrets. So this was well understood, but not deployed. And then I think a big benefit of those revelations is that big companies like Google and Microsoft switched to forward secrecy in November 2013. And for TLS 1.3, also forward secrecy will become the mandatory option or the default option. So this is a big improvement. You should always think about this um, what if my device is hacked, do I also expose the past? Of course, and this shows you the Achilles heel of email protection. In email, you can't do this. Because in email, you, you don't know when the guy will open the mail and decrypt, so he has to keep his key. So as long as you keep this key, you actually um, have to, you're vulnerable to exposure. So you would have to find a, a way you can use email where your key changes all the time. It becomes more like chat. So we have to maybe also think about redoing email in a more chat-like way. Denial of service, of course, also have to look at it. But in general, if you look at all our protocols, it's kind of, you can say we have to redo the internet, which sounds a bit crazy. But on the other hand, all these protocols were designed not with security in mind, with survivability, and they're not even very survivable. Okay? So DNS is now made secure, but there is no deployment, or not enough deployment. And in fact, still big debates about whether the way it's being done today is proper or not. BGP is still under development. It's amazing that we still don't have secure routing given all the investments in the internet. Uh, but I think in general, HTTP should be secure by default, and so email should be secure by default, and so on and so on. You should not have this patchwork where all these things, you add stuff on, and hopefully the only guy uses it too, and so on. So we should really, if we're serious, we should actually go back to the drawing table, try to keep as much as we have, but also try to redesign what's needed. Metadata protection is actually, um, a very big problem, which is, I would say, not given enough attention. Um, there is, of course, a Tor system, which is very nice. It has 6,000 nodes, and it has several million users. So in that sense, it's a very big step forward, because it's not only research papers, it exists. But Tor was not designed to resist global adversaries. Also, Tor seems to be shifting their battle more to battling internet censorship than actually um, they're not, their main concern is not traffic analysis in particular. I think if they're honest, they admit that with the, what we have now, they can never protect against the NSA because it's just too difficult. The NSA is too powerful. <laughs> yes? Um, did you see the recent exploit, I think, yesterday of using mouse movements to, yes. uh, in real time, get everybody through Tor? It's a, it's a, it's a major problem, yes. So um, what to do? Well, David Charm who is the guy behind eCash and anonymous communications and who invented the first mixnet. He's been working on a new system called Private Equity. I recommend you look at it. It's not clear it will be scalable, but at least he has some new ideas to protect against global attackers and have anonymous communication and build the whole infrastructure on top of this. So I think it's we should think about this more. 
A very big problem is location privacy. This is really, really hard to protect. Because we just, as humans, we can switch servers um, in the Tor network, but we cannot, as humans, go 100 miles away within a millisecond. We can't do this. Okay? So we actually are in a physical location, plus all our devices emit all these signals that allow us to be tracked. So I think location privacy is a major problem. And I think it can not only be solved by technology, it can also be solved by legal protections which can't be allowed to track people. That's, that's um, a very big battle for the future. If you look at how we teach crypto, we tell people crypto is about moving protection of secrets to keys. Okay? And this is actually a much easier problem because you just have to manage keys. But I guess what we didn't think about is that the NSA says, okay, then we'll go after the keys. So by using crypto, we create in this system a single point of failure, a single piece of information that's very valuable. And of course, we didn't think of security matters as an attack model. At least I never thought about it. It's a very new attack model where someone just asks for the key. <coughs> so what we should have is a much more robust system. And in fact, cryptography has been working on this since the late 80s. Um, and there has been quite some progress now. You can actually put shares of your key in multiple places, maybe even under multiple jurisdictions, although that makes, of course, lawyers very, very worried because they will it's too complex for them to figure out what will happen. But the idea is that even if a small set of those keys are compromised, if the majority is honest, in fact, your system stays secure. So we should actually make it a lot harder and not put all our keys um, in one place. Of course, the pessimists will say, well, we don't have redundancy. We only have Windows, um, Linux, and Android, and iOS, and that's it. And in fact, iOS also is based in some sense on Unix. So we don't have diversity. But in fact, it doesn't matter because the NSA will compromise all of that. That's the pessimist view. The optimist view is we should maybe think of new operating systems and we should create diversity and think about how to do things differently um, and not use general purpose machines for some of these purposes, but have dedicated hardware machines maybe running on bare metal or middle or so that it's much harder to compromise. So this was, of course, unthinkable when it was developed. Uh, because communication was too expensive, machines are too expensive, but today machines are cheap, communication is cheap. It's actually feasible if you're willing to wait instead of 10, 100 milliseconds, a few seconds, you can actually do many of those things. So why do we rely on one certificate for a web server which is important? Why can't we wait for five certificates? And make sure this key is certified by several people who kind of use more reputation-based mechanisms and so on. So I think you should really think much more carefully the crypto step is fine, but then we should not go to a single point of failure. We should be much more robust. And it can be done. With just, there is many ideas in the literature. There is almost no deployment. And the computer system security, this is, of course, the harder problem. The concept is an easy problem, which you don't know how to solve anyway. Or we don't have solutions today. But about the security problem, of course, there is error possible at all attacks. And we had the whole week, you had lectures about this, the problems. <coughs> Governments have put access to those weaknesses. You may be aware that Heartbeat was reported and very quickly it ended up in the US CERC. So probably the NSA knew about Heartbeat way before many of us. And they probably started exporting it way before any of us were informed. But this is also a major problem. We see the same thing in Europe with the NRS directive. So the Network Information Security Directive, what you have to do is you have to inform your national agency if you have a breach or a problem. And so the question is, will they use it to help everybody else, or will they first use it to help themselves and then help everybody else? And this debate is not even had. You can't ask this question even. We need to update our machines, and we seem to have accepted this. Okay, I mean, I remember that my early machines, I didn't want to update them. There were not many security updates anyway at the time. But so now, because of security weaknesses, because security was not done right, you're forced to update all the time. But of course, we all understand that if somebody can update your machine, that you're actually vulnerable to them. Right? They can always give you a special update which puts a backdoor in your machine. And even processors. Modern processors can be updated remotely. Most people are not aware of this. But your processor can get special code, special micro code to do things differently. Okay? Our defenses, you know, what we have is firewall antivirus, and then what you see now is the new thing is, well, new is this socks, this seams, whatever, this idea of central intelligence. We're going to monitor everything, and then we'll find out what, who the bad guys are. 
So in fact, what we now see in the companies, they're selling mass surveillance at the company scale. And of course, you can say this is fine because if you work in the company, you give away your soul. But what if the centers are compromised? And in the end, it's still mass surveillance, and it is data that can be abused. And the government can come and ask for access to your SOC and see what everything is, everybody is doing. So if it's your um, employees, you can argue whether or not you're protected by law, it's acceptable. But of course, it's also your customers you're massively spying on. So what we see is that in response to the security crisis, rather than building more prevention, the corporations are building more spying and detection, and they're helping the government in their mass surveillance. And so the statistics I heard were shocking. Gardner believes that spending on detection will go up from 10% to 60% of security in the next six years. So we kind of abandon prevention. No, we can't build secure systems. No, we can't make good code. We're going to watch everybody all the time and see what they do. This will help keep the world secure. This is the US vision on security. And we somehow, as Europeans, we nicely uh, not and we accept it. And of course, our companies make lots of money with it as well. Human factors is also a big problem we haven't looked at enough. So I think I would not have believed that the US company would backdoor its random number generator for $10 million, but apparently they do this. Money is money. And so here's a famous picture of Cisco boxes being opened, and then the NSA employees add some extra chips to it so they work better for them. <laughs> and so I've been talking to several companies, so some companies now go in person to pick up their hardware where it's being produced to make sure that this doesn't happen. So data at rest is the easy part of security. You can, of course, use BitLocker if you trust Microsoft not to use the backdoor they may have. Um, you can use TrueCrypt. In the cloud, we should use it more, but it's actually not used enough. But of course, what if you have to compute on your data? Then encryption uh, doesn't help. We'll come back to this. We should, of course, look many more at all the stages. Crypto design. Is there cryptography or cryptovirology happening? Hardware backdoors, the US government is spending lots of money because they're actually worried because most US hardware is produced in Asia. So do the Asians put backdoors in the US hardware? So can you detect this? Can you prevent this? Software backdoors, um, modifying devices, um, doing shipment, configuration errors, updates where you insert backdoors, and what happens to all the things at the end of the lifetime, people are maybe starting to search in those as well. So we've been focusing mostly on a few phases. I think we now understand better we have to look at all the phases. So I think if we want to have a long-term robust solution, we should think about the architecture. Architecture is politics. It's not a technical decision. The fact that all data is now concentrated in a few clouds, of course, saves an enormous amount of money and allows you to fire many system managers and other annoying people. But on the other hand, so it means brings great cost savings to companies. But of course, it also is an architecture which has political consequences. It means you become dependent on central point of failure. So what we've been told is that if you want utility, you have to give up your privacy, you get cool systems that are nice, we should really, as researchers, look at improving this trade-off rather than accepting the trade-off and just giving up the data. You should go to minimal disclosure. The idea that all data should go to the cloud, I think, is nonsense. Your smartphone has, these days, between 16 and 100 gigabytes of storage has more computational power than a Cray from the early 80s. But still, you've been convinced by the companies that this is not enough to store your data. It all has to go to the cloud. Of course, you want a backup, but why can this backup not be in your home or somewhere with your friends or distributed over five places? Why should it be in one central place? It's just a way of thinking. We've been told to do this. And of course, if you do collect data centrally, why not encrypt it? And you see, of course, that the big players are now doing this. Whether it's at the consequence of the Jennifer Lopez incident or some other, or the Snowden, we don't know, but they do this. But the question is, do they have backdoors? Or do either the FBI or the NSA, can they force them to have backdoors? From the FBI, we'll know the answer. From the NSA, we will not know the answer. That's the difference. Okay? And of course, with crypto, we can do some stuff. So, in fact, my first proposal is keep data with the users, keep it on your local devices, and do local backups. Okay? There is things like own cloud and whatever you could share this with friends. So even if your house burns down, you still have your data. You just have to rethink stuff. And like in energy, energy production was first distributed, then it became centralized, and now it's going to be distributed again. And there is no reason why it shouldn't be done differently. Why should we not move back and go to distributed? It can be progress. 
Okay, an example is road pricing. So the current road pricing systems, they put gantries everywhere and they film everybody. Well, in fact, you can perfectly do road pricing with a module in the car that keeps track where you drove and gives you the bill without the government having to know where you've been driving. You can do this perfectly, and we show this in our group with a system that worked five years ago. Everything included, mapping, GPS, cryptographic security, everything was done five years ago, yet all the systems rolled out are centralized. Why? Because the governments want the data, of course. <coughs> if you put data in the cloud, then encrypt it, and keep this, the key with the users, and there is some progress in crypto, um, don't believe everything IBM says about fully moved encryption, but there is some things you can do on encrypted data. You can do search on it, you can compute simple statistics, you can do a few multiplications and many additions. So this is research in progress. You can do analysis of some encrypted data to some extent, but don't believe you can do anything and you will pay a high price in performance. So if you look at all the back doors, I don't want to sound naive and say we should go to open or free software and all cold software is, bad, is worse and is bad, but I think, to be honest, if we see how many times we've been screwed over by all our vendors which use closed source, I think the only solution is open source. That's the only way we can have governments not put backdoors in our systems and be sure of it. Of course, we still need much better governance to avoid kind of hard bleed things. I'm not naive to think that this will solve everything, but it's just the first step. If we don't take that first step, we can as well give up. Keep it simple. And so, time to wrap up. So we have to rethink our architectures. And this mantra of everything in the cloud, centralized, this is going to solve everything, or well, it's create mass surveillance, that's what we know. Okay? We should think more about system security. We should think of very powerful opponents that open boxes, that add chips, and so on. We should go to open technologies and open reviews, and the government should actually fund this. Open software is a public good, and the government should spend part of our money in paying companies or individuals to do code reviews or put out bounty programs and so on. And it should all be in a transparent and open way. And of course, there is also work for cryptographers. On the policy side, you should remember that passive surveillance is something of the past. Okay? Our governments are hacking everything they can to do surveillance. The idea that this is just listen to what's happening and catch the bad guys is very different. It is what they do is own everything, control everything, and then see what they can do. And I think if you look at IoT, this is going to be a nightmare. If you look at increasing dependence on IT systems for power grid, for our houses, for our buildings, for our transportation system, it's very hard to secure it when the government helps you. We now live in a world where the government tries to hack you. And the best people in the government try to undermine our systems and not tell us 10% of the zero days they find. So I think it's a major problem, but of course, we have to convince our politicians that they should think the other way. Today, Europe lives in an area of cyber colonialism. The Chinese and Russians, and I don't want to live there, they have their own systems. But in Europe, we're completely dependent on the US systems and they decide what the rules are. So, of course, we need an industrial policy that's guarantees our legal sovereignty. We need politicians who have the power and the courage to say this. And of course, I don't want in Europe European security made by the Germans or by the French. Because then the German or French government will be able to hack. We should have European security made by the Europeans. Okay? And of course, we have to think about law enforcement. Um, they should not be using as much malware or backdoors, but they should be able to get access to the data. So here's more resources. You'll get the slides of this. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.